name is John O'Sullivan. I'm the president of the Danube Institute here in Budapest, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to a discussion on constitutional law and its challenges. My pleasure, because I'm certain that this afternoon we'll have a stimulating and entertaining debate on a very important topic in the politics of both continental Europe and the English-speaking world or the Anglosphere. My privilege, because our two speakers are two of the most prominent, original, and intellectually productive experts on the topic as a whole, and in each case, in the constitutional cultures of retrospectively, of respectively, the English-speaking world, Professor James Allen, and of continental Europe, Professor Ishvan Stumpf. Both our speakers have extraordinarily distinguished and varied careers in which they rose to eminence. I could not possibly read out the two biographies which are available to you uh, on your seats because it would take about 15 minutes for me to do so, and I don't think it, you came here to listen to me. But I urge you to read both biographies carefully because they show that both speakers have rich experience both in legal circles and outside them in university life, government, philosophy, and politics. They are truly experts in this topic. As a proud non-expert myself, I'm not proposing to talk at length about constitutional law, except to say what is generally believed by other non-experts, that the European tradition rooted in Roman law gives more authority to judges in determining the final legal outcomes of cases involving rights in law, especially human rights, while the English-speaking tradition, bound around by the legal supremacy of Parliament, has traditionally given greater final authority to majorities in parliaments and elections. Of course, both traditions have similarities as well as differences, and both are changing all the time under the pressure of new political and legal challenges. Still, I think it's fair to say that the English-speaking Anglo-American tradition has yielded quite a lot of ground to the continental one in recent years under two influences. First, the growth and influence of European law um, and practice, uh, while the United, in particularly human rights law, um, and while the United Kingdom uh, was part uh, of the uh, European Union. Uh, the second and more surprising one is how expanded interpretations uh, of the US Bill of Rights giving courts the task of protecting those rights have influenced the law in a, a number of uh, English-speaking countries as well as the United States itself. All of which means, maybe, that judges, judges and courts now have a more visible impact on all our lives. Uh, should we be worried by this? Well, I'll be happy to be corrected on that and all points by the two scholars of distinction here today who can both claim to have made significant contributions to the development of constitutional law in different ways. Professor Allen, by his theoretical criticisms of how the protection of rights by courts has limited and constrained the rights of democracy in a series of books, most recently, The Age of Foolishness. Professor Stump, by his influential proposal as a former head of the Constitutional, of Hungary, uh, Constitutional Court in Hungary, of how the constitutional courts of EU member states might combine with each other to protect the national and constitutional identities of their diverse nations against extravagant interpretations of EU legal supremacy. Well, our speakers will obviously give different answers to such questions in their remarks. Um, after both have spoken, and I'm inviting Professor Allen to speak first, after both have spoken, um, we'll have a chance to put questions to them. And now, however, I invite Professor Allen to address us. Thank you, John, for that uh, incredibly generous introduction. If my dad had been here, he would have loved to have heard it. Uh, my mom would have believed it. Um, well, let me start uh, this evening by thanking uh, the Danube Institute uh, for having invited me and my wife uh, here to Budapest. Um, I've known as director uh, John O'Sullivan since about 2015, 2016. Um, 
John was brought over to Australia. I'm Canadian, as you can tell from the accent, but uh, I have lived and worked in Australia since about 16 years ago, 17 years ago. And John was brought over to be the temporary editor of Australia's oldest uh, conservative monthly publication, uh, Quadrant. Um, and of course, I knew the name, uh, John O'Sullivan, and that he'd written this uh, incredibly great book on Thatcher, Reagan, uh, and the Pope and their influence on the collapse of the Soviet Union. I'm sure many of you have read it too. And it was only after I met John, though, at a few conferences in Australia, met him in person, that uh, came out of a like a bolt out of the blue that I realized, uh, I thought to myself, John O'Sullivan is the best connected and most insightful conservative in the entire English-speaking world. Uh, he is. Um, as many of you know, he was the former speechwriter for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, he's a former editor of an elite American uh, publication, National Review. And from my, from my native Canada, he was the founding editor of Canada's National Post under uh, the wonderful publisher Conrad Black. That was back when the paper was conservative. Um, not sure it really is anymore. Uh, and of course, John contributes to every conservative and non-conservative publication going. But most importantly, he runs this magnificent institute, the Danube Institute. Um, and this is the best part. John has an eponymous name. He has a law named after him. Now, not many people have a law named after him, but if you go online, you can look up O'Sullivan's Law, uh, named after John. Let me quote what the law states. All organizations that are not actually right-wing will over time become left-wing. Now, speaking for myself, I have never yet come across an institution, or sorry, an instance where that law has shown to be wrong. So uh, that's pretty good. And virtually every university that I've worked at, US, Britain, Canada, Australia, it is living proof of this law. And it's becoming true with big corporations as they become more and more woke and the HR departments seem to take over. And it certainly seems to be true um, in all sorts of other institutions as they become woke uh, on a scale faster than uh, President Biden's aides can end any interactions he seems to have with the press. So uh, again, let me just say what a privilege it is to be here. I'd also like to thank Melissa, who did so much work to bring um, my wife and me here. It's an honor that uh, Professor Stumpf, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, has taken the time to be here today. And all of the other members of the Danube Institute, I won't name largely because I'm not very good at some of the names that don't roll off my tongue very well um, for having done all the work to bring us here. And of course, you have a magnificently beautiful city. Budapest is wonderful. We've had a chance, my wife and I, to wander around both the last couple of days and then uh, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago. Now, before we flew over, uh, before flying here, uh, my wife and I spent eight or nine days in London. Our children live and work there. And I actually had a commitment with another wonderful organization. It's called the Free Speech Union, set up by a one-time uh, associate, not associate, but uh, John would have known him. It's a pro-free speech organization, and they fight back against uh, cancel culture and you know trying to get rid of people for having views that are slightly to the right of center. And it was an organization set up by Toby Young. He writes for the London Telegraph. He writes for the uh, Spectator. And of course, in doing this function for the Free Speech Union. Um, and one of the things the Free Speech Union does is if they try to cancel a conservative, the Free Speech Union will look at the people who complain and they'll go back through 15 years of their social media and they'll find things that they said. And it's a fantastic tactic actually. But I was doing this function for them and of course there were a couple of lawyers there. And some of these lawyers were deeply, deeply skeptical of things EU related, not surprisingly. And, you know, some of them were particularly skeptical of the uh, European Court of Justice. They saw this court as unconstrained activist, an expansionist arm of an uber federalizing supranationalist body. And I'm being polite when I characterize their views. Um, you know, one, a body that regularly ignores the clear terms of the legal text ignores the intentions of the drafters of the treaty. At any rate, I was chatting to one of these lawyers and uh, out of the blue, he tells me the story. Was, you know, this is a very skeptical lawyer of the 
European Court of Justice, and he was wandering down a street in London, and he stumbled on this, this bottle, this medieval bottle, looked like it had come from Turkey, and he picked it up and rubbed it, and this very special genie emerged. And the genie said to him, you have three wishes. And this skeptical lawyer said, oh, that's fantastic. She said, I have to warn you. Every wish you are granted, every single member of the European Court of Justice will get twice what you get. So the lawyer, the skeptical lawyer thought, and he said, well, I wouldn't mind a million dollars. So she blinked her eyes and she said, now remember, every single judge in the European Court of Justice now has $2 million. He thought and he said, well, I've been in Hungary and I realized that the Hungarians are now producing a lot of the top level German cars, you know, something like 80% of Audis are produced in um, Hungary. So I'd like a brand new Audi. She blinked her eyes. It's all yours, but remember, every single member of the European Court of Justice now has two brand new Audis. So what is your third and final wish? And this skeptical lawyer looked at her and he said, you know, I've always wanted to donate a kidney. Oh. <laughs> right, okay, so let me start by giving you a very brief outline um, of my latest book, and then I'm going to pick out three topics. I'll run you through them. Just as a matter of interest, how many people here are lawyers? Okay, so not very many. All right, okay, so I'll gauge it that way. Um, so basically, this book is coming out in the next month or two uh, by an American publisher. And in the book, I effectively claim, or I doubt, the, the basic gist is that I doubt a lot of the legal orthodoxy as regards um, acceptable constitutionalism in the a modern democracy. So the basic consensus amongst the lawyerly cast, and I'm pretty much only competent to speak about the Anglosphere, uh, the English-speaking world. So I think some of this applies to the, you know, the civilian world. Um, you know, in the in the democratic world, there's basically two traditions. Uh, there's the common law tradition that flowed out of Britain, and it, it is in all of those. That, parts of the world that were part of the British Empire, which um, I was incredibly, you know, I won the lottery by being born speaking English because, well, you know, we train lawyers in Queensland, Australia, Australia, and they end up practicing law in London. They practice law in New York. Lawyers from India can do that. Lawyers from Singapore do that. Part of that is just winning the lottery of being part of, you know, the, the map used to go down when I was in primary school in Toronto. And, all the parts that had been part of the British Empire were pink. It was like two thirds of the globe. Um, and so all of people who learn law in those places, A, they speak English and B, they, they learn the common law way of looking at things. Now, the difference between the common law and those parts of the democratic world that have taken their legal tradition from Roman law, codes, civilian way of thinking, the difference is not the rules. The rules are often very similar. And in fact, within the common law world, the rules are often quite different. It's the way problems are approached. And because you've been educated in the common law tradition, you can leave Delhi and start working in London. Whereas someone coming from the civilian has to rethink how they approach things. It's not a huge difference, but uh, it, we're very lucky. And um, so I am focused on what I know, which is the common law world to the extent Anything I say is a bit jarring for those of you with a civilian tradition, um, I'm happy to hear about it. But certainly in the common law world, uh, the consensus that's emerged amongst the lawyerly caste uh, is one that, when, or A, I don't like it, and B, I think it's uh, suboptimal. Uh, I'll, at the risk of painting too broad a picture, I don't think the lawyerly caste has very much love of democracy. I think they're basically closet aristocrats, take out the land-owning aristocrats of the 18th, 17th century and substitute people who've had a law degree and training in law and have uh, you know, worked as lawyers or judges. And uh, I think deep down, many of them feel that their sense of what is rights respecting is better than that of a plumber or a secretary. I don't really agree with that, but um, that seems to me to be a fair characterization of uh, you know, the median view of the lawyerly caste. And I think hand in hand with that sort of disdain for the um, average voter, um, 
their troubles, this sort of concomitant love for the unelected judges, who adopt approaches to interpreting legal texts. So constitutions I'm focused on, but statutes as well. Um, and the approaches they take to interpreting the text effectively leave the point of application interpreter unconstrained. So what you have is not a regard for the legitimate author of the legal text and what he, she, or they intended or what the clear words of the text seem to direct, but in fact, you adopt an approach to interpretation which really leaves you, the interpreter, very unconstrained. And we certainly see that uh, in top common law courts. So on this approach to interpretation, um, on this approach, <clears throat> the judges are not locked in by the intentions of those who are understood to have the legitimate authority to make the law in the first place, or to create the constitution, or to draft the treaty. And again, you know, the, the approach the European Court of Justice takes to interpreting the legal treaties just uh, sort of staggering. Um, it's hard to see anything really that locks them in and binds the choices they can make. I always say that if you're interpreting a text and the answer you give is exactly the same as the one you would have written had you been the author of the text, that is not interpreting. If every single time the answer you come up with as the interpreter is what you would have liked the text to say, you're not interpreting. You know, if you think that uh, Pride and Prejudice is really about uh, falling in love with an ugly guy who doesn't own any property, you're not interpreting Pride and Prejudice. You're rewriting it. Um, so it's hard to see sometimes when you read decisions of particularly the Supreme Court of Canada, but also a um, little less so these days, but the Supreme Court in the US, SCOTUS, what is it that's locking them in and binding their choices? What is it that's external to the workings of their own brain? You know, you can call that the product of their druthers, their policy preferences, their moral beliefs, their sincere desire to achieve rights-based outcomes. You know, sometimes you can get highfalutin legal philosophers might say it's their, their deep-seated commitment to discovering Kantian deontological duties, whatever. But the point is, interpreting is discovering the intended meaning by somebody other than you. And if you're doing it honestly, it can't always line up with what you want. And we see, I think we see with top courts sometimes that's clearly not what's happening. Um, you know, they're, they're uh, turning themselves into the de facto authors of the text. So they're transmogrifying the constitutional text into a document that gives them the outcomes that really they would have uh, wanted had they been the authors, the legislators, the constitution makers. Um, sometimes this is through the vehicle of what's known as the living constitution. Constitutions are marks on paper. You know, Justice Scalia in the US Supreme Court used to say, this is not alive. It doesn't even look like it's alive. Um, the whole idea of a living constitution is extremely hard to cash out in any philosophically coherent sense. I'll come back to that. But what this does is it inoculates them against democratic um, gainsaying or overriding, right? It makes it very difficult for voters to respond because voters, um, uh, constitutional law is, is, is higher than um, regular law, domestic law, municipal law. And so the judiciary becomes a sort of aristocratic upper house. And often what they deliver these uh, judges through these interpretive approaches is something that very few present day voters or indeed constitution ma makers in the past would have wanted. They've had very little input into it and they don't really like it. And welcoming that sort of, so welcoming these unconstrained approaches to constitutional interpretation, far too many people in the lawyerly cast, I think, far too many judges, and again, I'm. I'm speaking in general terms, there are outliers, of course. Um, but this is part of a new orthodoxy, living constitution, moral readings, Dworkinian readings. Um, it's something that's overwhelmingly taught in the law schools and it's taught in glowing, highly favorable terms. Um, it's crept into the big law firms, which is hardly surprising because the law firms hire the people who are taught in the law schools. And I am uh, skeptical of this modern constitutional settlement or orthodoxy. 
I don't think it's desirable, and I don't like it on the substantive merits. Um, I'm also, to be honest, uh, pretty skeptical of the orthodoxy on what the orthodoxy rests or sits. So much of today's world is the sort of modern human rights world, right? Again, in the English-speaking world, what you had was um, the whole natural law tradition. And you cannot understand human rights today in any empirical, historical sense without linking it to the Christians and Christian worldview, right? So historically, it clearly flows out of the Christian way of looking at the world. <clears throat> natural law is, a, is, is you know, a way of linking human laws to something higher. And that dominates in the English-speaking world at any rate until <clears throat> maybe Bentham in the late 1700s. Um, Bentham and the utilitarians kill it off. I mean, outside of the United States, because there's this Jeffersonian tradition when you read the Declaration of Independence, there are these rights that are these self-evident rights. <clears throat> but Bentham really comes along and kills it off in the English-speaking world. He's skeptical of uh, non-government delivered rights. And Australia might be the most utilitarian country on the planet in terms of its outlook and history. It hasn't panned out very well during the pandemic if you don't like lockdowns, and I don't. Um, but uh, certainly it sweeps through the entire English-speaking world. And that basically, and this is a potted history, holds true until after the Second World War. Uh, one of the side effects of the Second World War with the Holocaust and everything is, is effectively the rebirth of natural law thinking. You know, that there are these higher entitlements that humans get just because they're human. We, you know, I tell some students, you are living through the rebirth of natural law thinking. It's, it's new. We don't call it natural law thinking. We rebrand it in the language of human rights. But really, there's not a lot of difference. There's a few little differences at the margins. But thinking that there are these entitlements you get simply because you're human, the new era, the human rights era. Um, and one of the things I started in my book is I'm, it's pretty hard to ground the whole entire human rights way of looking at the world these days. In olden times, when you linked it to a benevolent theistic God, it's quite easy. Where do they come from? God! You can quibble about what exactly um, those entitlements might have been from your benevolent theistic deity, but you know you had a clear source. In a more secular world like today, and you know most of the thinkers I'm talking about today are secular, um, they have a very difficult time in grounding human rights. Once you cut off the link to a, a god, you can try to run it through some sort of Kantian deontology, but it's not easy and it's not very convincing. You can try to run it through social contract theory. You know, what would people have agreed to if they were behind a veil of ignorance, Rawls, or go back to Locke or Hobbes? Social contract theory, though, has a really big problem uh, that was pointed out by my favorite philosopher. I did a doctorate on him, David Hume, the great Scottish Enlightenment skeptic. And Hume is purported to have said social contract theory isn't worth the paper it wasn't written on. Because the thing is, none of us are ever asked what we would have done. And you know, the history of the world is a history of you know, violence. A lot of violence, and when it's not violence, if you're lucky, governments, monarchs are giving you little bits of entitlements and rights which you work to make bigger. Um, and so I don't think it's easy to cash out the rights human rights in today's world. Often what happens in law is they'll just say, oh, well, you know, we won't really worry about where these things came from or how they're found. Or if you're lucky, someone might say, well, you know, we can always go back to Eleanor Roosevelt who helped draft the UN Declaration on Human Rights. And then that's supposed to be an answer. And then we move on. Um, so that's problematic. Um, uh, Here's another, here's another thing. Um, you know, the idea of the rule of law, again, some, you, you, there used to be a very old-fashioned procedural understanding of the rule of law. You know, we want to live in a system where the rules are known in advance, general, apply to everyone. That's the old-fashioned procedural sense. Almost impossible to be against that. But these days, 
the orthodoxy infu makes it, it morally impregnates it with substantive moral desires. And I talk about this also in the context of democracy, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. But, you know, one of the tricks is to redefine the idea of democracy. So let me come back to that in a minute. Um, and I do that in the book. And then, you know, having talked about democracy a bit and the emerging orthodoxy amongst the lawyerly caste, and I think the administrative state and bureaucrats, where they're not really committed to democratic decision-making in the same sort of way that I am, um, and again, I don't think judges are. I finished the book really by looking at uh, constitutionalism itself, written constitutionalism, unwritten constitutionalism. John comes from one of the great unwritten constitutional setups. I'll come back to this, but in the English speaking world, there are two successful approaches to constitutionalism and only two. There is the parliamentary sovereignty system of Britain, goes often traced to Dicey, incredibly successful. You know, the Brits have not had a written constitution. They had effectively one while they were in the EU, but they've gone back out. But for a thousand years, how can you not have a written constitution in today's world and be successful? But they don't. And neither does New Zealand. And neither arguably does Israel. Those are the only three in the democratic world. Israel's debatable. Um, well, one reason Britain's never had a written constitution, and this is pretty incredible, for 1,100 years, no one has successfully invaded Britain. Don't count the Channel Islands in World War II. So there's never been a need, really. You know, written constitutions often come in when you lose a war, or there's been a successful revolution. Never happened in Britain. This is pretty remarkable. And of course, New Zealand just inherited the British setup. It is incredibly successful. Talk about that in a minute. And the other great tradition in the English-speaking world when it comes to constitutionalism is the American one. 230 years, you cannot deny the success. And in some ways it's remarkable because the Americans had to come up with a written constitution without copying other people. The normal way you come up with a constitution these days is you look around and you copy, right? You're crazy not to copy, you see what works, you copy. The genius who wrote the American Constitution, he didn't write it all by himself, but largely was James Madison. So the Madisonian written constitution is the American Constitution. I'm Canadian, so as a digression, I have to tell you that Madison was a fantastic legislator and constitutional drafter. He was a terrible president. As the fourth president of the United States, he invaded Canada in the War of 1812. We learned this in Canada. The Americans gloss over it because you know they lost. Uh, well, they didn't lose, it was a draw, but it was close to a loss. We burned down their presidential palace. That's why it's called the White House, by the way, if you didn't know that. Uh, in the War of 1812, two years into it, in 1814, the Brits, having finished off Napoleon, because one of the reasons he invaded, because the Brits were busy in Europe, but once Napoleon was done, all of a sudden the Brits came over to North America and it didn't look like such a good decision anymore for Mr. Madison. Um, and the Northern Americans, New England people, they wouldn't fight. It was all Southern soldiers who came up to fight. Um, the Brits burned down the American uh, presidential palace and when they rebuilt it, they painted it white, the White House there. Um, so he was a terrible president, but he was a genius. I mean, the, coming up with the American constitution, what did he have to look at? He had the Roman world, the Greek world, and he knew his British constitutional history, right? And he comes up with what really is a checks and balances written constitution that has stood the test of time, 230 years. You know, the Italian written constitution, you know, you can usually time it in real time when you're gonna get the next um, iteration of the Italian constitution. I'm being facetious, but you know, if you get five years out of it, even the French for a while were getting new constitutions on a pretty regular basis. Um, the American one is quite distinct from the British one. What you do in the American one is you, try to check and balance every different area of power. Whereas in the British system, you just give unlimited power to the one elected legislature. You can't get more democratic than that in Britain. Each generation decides for itself. What a great democratic model. I tell, in the American model, you just check and balance everything. Sometimes people describe the American constitution as a separation of powers regime, but it's not really, you know. Right now, 
in the US, the vice president in the executive has the casting vote in the Senate, the legislature. No separation of powers there. And if anyone, you know, when they have impeachments of presidents, which under uh, a Republican president, the Democrats in you know, legislatures try to do every day, um, the person who officiates at the impeachment trial in the Senate is the chief justice. No separation of powers there. It's best to think of the American Constitution as a checks and balances regime. So you have the most unbelievably powerful bicameral system. I don't know what it's like here in Hungary, but I suspect it's like Britain, New Zealand, Australia. The elected officials who really matter are in the lower house. The prime minister has to be in the lower house in Britain, right? The prime minister has to be in the lower house in Australia, has to be in the lower house in Canada. If you're in the US, you don't want, if you had a choice between getting elected to the House of Representatives, the lower house or the Senate, you wouldn't pick the House of Representatives. You want to be in the Senate. Now, this is pretty unusual. Just think about it. The lower house is basically one vote, one value, right? You divide the country up into equal number, into a bunch of districts or constituencies where there's about the same number of voters in each one. And so that has real majoritarian legitimacy. The American Senate is about as disproportionate as you can get. Each state has two senators. California has almost 40 million people. Wyoming, I think, is the least populous US state. It'll soon be Vermont. But right now, I think it's still Wyoming. It has about, I don't know, 680,000. Basically, if you're voting for senator in Wyoming, your vote is worth something like 77 or 78 times what it is in California. This is the rotten borough system that they got rid of in Britain, you know, back in the 1800s at the first reform bill or the second reform bill. And so this is an odd system, but it's a checks and balances system where your upper house is balancing your lower house. And of course, you give lots of powers to the 50 states or the, at that, that point 13, and the states balance the center. It's a distrust of human nature. And Madison was a genius. I don't personally think the American model translates to newly developed democratic countries as well as uh, a legislative, you know, when you hear the phrase Westminster system, that's just a parliamentary system, right? You can have a indirectly elected president, but um, so I talk a bit about that, written constitution, unwritten constitutionalism, and then I finish the book with uh, talking about how written texts are interpreted. Um, and that matters too, because if there's too much scope for people who are interpreting the text to get any answer they want, what's the point of what you write down? And when you think about it, when, uh, uh, you know, in Canada, when I was just about to start law school, they brought in a, a written entrenched bill of rights. It turned out to be more powerful or at least the judges interpreting it have turned out to be more powerful even than the American Supreme Court. But every single word was fought over. Every single comma was fought over. Why do you argue over every single word? Because you assume that the decisions you're making at the time of drafting are going to have some sort of uh, effect down the road. They haven't. In fact, when interpreting it, the Canadian judges often say, it doesn't matter what the people drafting it intended. Well, that's another way of saying that you're not constrained. So I'm gonna tell you a few things about that before I finish and, and Professor Stumpf uh, corrects almost everything I've said, which I'm uh, a little bit leery of. Uh, okay, so um, let me just pick three things and uh, talk about that and then finish. So what motivates written constitutionalism? Again, um, only two choices in the world. I think you're either someone who likes unlimited legislative power, parliamentary sovereignty in the elected branch. And one of the things, the best example until Britain came out of um, the EU was New Zealand. New Zealand has one legislature, no federal system. It's unicameral, no upper house. You elect the legislature in New Zealand and they can do whatever they want. There are no legal limits. I say that Americans can't get over this. There is nothing that you can say about a, a, a statute in New Zealand. The judges will never invalidate it. 
So what are the limits on that system? Well, they're political. You get elections every three years. And they're moral. Generally speaking, we tend not to elect people whose views are morally abhorrent. You know, I've always said when you line up the politicians in Australia from left to right, the difference between them is small compared to what you see at the world at large. You bring in a North Korean, some of the non-democratic people from the Middle East, whatever. Their moral world, the consensus is huge. But the only limits in a parliamentary sovereignty system are moral and political. And the Americans usually say, but, you know, that's awful. You know, don't you want legal limits? And I said to them, well, you have to understand that if you have a system with a written constitution interpreted by a top court, the American Supreme Court, the exact same true, the exact same thing is true of the American Supreme Court. There are no legal limits on them. There are only moral and political limits. If they take a text and they decide that actually there's an entitlement to abortions that nobody honestly reading the text thinks there is, the only limits on those judges are moral. We hope judges are honest in interpreting the text. They aren't always. And political. What can we do when they go off the rails? Newspapers can write stinging editorials. New presidents can appoint new judges. But for the top body that interprets the text, there are no legal constraints on them because they are telling us what the top legal... This is inevitable in any human institutional setup. There must be some group of people who ultimately are only constrained by morality and politics. Now, the parliamentary sovereignty system is very democratic, right? Each generation decides for itself. You're not locked in. Um, you know, you might build in checks and balances by having an upper house, but again, there aren't many democratic setups that have a very powerful upper house. Australia does have one, Italy has one, but not many. And the other model, as we said, was the Madisonian written constitution. Um, again, uh, he, did a, he didn't write it all, but he wrote most of it, and it's brilliant. It's stood the test of time. Um, not many people know that James Madison was against having a Bill of Rights when he first wrote the American Constitution. He did not want a Bill of Rights. He thought that all of the work, the, the, all of the work in constraining power would be done by the checks and balances, the upper house, the lower house, federalism. He ended up going for a Bill of Rights when it became clear that uh, the Federalists were losing to the Anti-Federalists when they were trying to sell the American Constitution. Um, because the Articles of Confederation just weren't working, right? And Madison just said, if the only way to get this through is to have a Bill of Rights, he, he was for it. Um, but those are the two incredibly successful options. One has unwritten constitutionalism at its heart. Uh, the other has written constitutionalism. And that's the massive majority of democratic states. So here's a question. Why would you go for written constitutionalism? What's the attraction? And basically, I think the attraction is you want to lock things in. What a written constitution gives you is a little bit of certainty, right? You're trading some of the flexibility. You know, in New Zealand, it's incredibly flexible. The legislature can do whatever you want. And you see that in New Zealand. You know, the, ch the political change doesn't go like this in New Zealand, it goes like this as each election brings in a different government. Now, does it work? Well, New Zealand was the first country in the world to give women the vote, so possibly arguable whether it works. That was, that was meant as a joke. Um, first country in the world to give the indigenous people. In 1867, uh, New Zealand gave Maori men the vote, and they reserved six constituencies for them. First country in the world to bring in social democratic labor relations, New Zealand. It also then became so ossified, it started to have an East German-like uh, economy, which they completely overhauled. In most countries, it's hard to pass a budget, right? The US, it's very hard to pass a budget. Why? Checks and balances. Got to get it through the House and the Senate. And often when they don't agree, you can't do anything. In New Zealand, you win an election, you do whatever you want. Nobody blocks you. Now, if you, if you go off the rails, you lose the next election. So with a written constitution, you're often trading flexibility for certainty and security. 
And that is a deal that many people would make. I personally like the um, sort of dicey and parliamentary stuff, but I understand the deal. I understand why you would want a written constitution. It's very attractive to have certain things locked in. You might lock in bicameralism. You might lock in federalism. You might lock in a list of moral entitlements that you articulate in the language of rights. But nobody would do that deal if they didn't have some guarantee of what it is they were trading, right? So in the British system, everything's on the democratic table. Madison comes along and says, we're gonna take a few things off the table. And you might make that deal, but you'd wanna know what is going off the table. And one of the problems with the way judges are interpreting things today is nobody knows what's on the table and off the table. You know the scope of rights keeps ratcheting up, the way they interpret the documents. And if you were honest with people, and I've said this a lot, if you know, Australia has tried to bring in a written bill of rights a number of times, always I'm on the opposing side. And what keeps stopping them in Australia is those of us who are opposed can keep saying, look what's happened in Canada. Look what's happened in Britain with their Human Rights Act. You get promised that this Bill of Rights will only take a certain number of issues off the democratic table. But it's not true, is it? Because the approach to interpreting the document blows up. It's a bit like if a supranational court were interpreting a federalist document and they paid no attention to the people, the intentions of the people who drafted the treaty and they paid no attention to the clear words and they kept channeling more and more power to the center. I don't say there's any doc, any court in the real world that actually looks like that, I leave that to you, but uh, you might argue that. Um, and that's a real problem. And so the thing is, you cannot sell that up front. It always happens after the fact. And I know this because in Australia, the people pushing for the Bill of Rights consistently say, we're only taking a little bit of things off the democratic table. But there's no way to stop the judges from adopting this pervasive sort of orthodox view of how you interpret these legal texts, and they are unconstrained in my view. And so that is one of the really big problems. It's almost dishonest. You, if, if you had told people when the Lisbon Treaty was coming in, this is the way the European court is going to interpret it, nobody would have signed up to it. Not even the French, you know, I don't even think they would have signed up to it. So you can't sell it that way. You have to sell it in the way that everyone understood the world when James Madison was drafting texts, that there would be some connection to the views of the people who had the legitimate authority to make the legal text. And that was, of course, true in the US right up to, you know, they didn't strike down an act of Congress until what, the 19, early 1900s, 1920. The American Supreme Court didn't get in the business of second guessing Congress really until the 1960s. And then, you know, they became popular because through that window, they were, you know, overturning some pretty awful Jim Crow laws and segregationism in the South. And you get this sort of, I don't know how to describe it. You get this setup where judges think of themselves almost as saviors, as sort of hero judges who are delivering the sort of outcomes that mere politicians, tawdry politicians, who actually have to get other human beings to vote for them, God forbid, they can't really deliver, so we'll deliver it for you. And that's fine if they deliver something you really want, but it's got terrible long-term consequences. You have to distinguish between substantive outcomes you like and acceptable procedures for delivering those outcomes. Um, you know, what I say to Americans and Canadians is, in both those countries, same-sex marriage was delivered by the judges. In Australia, New Zealand, Britain, it was delivered by the voters, either through a referendum, Ireland as well, either through a referendum or through the elected legislature. Now, there's no comparison in terms of legitimacy. In countries where the voters decided the issue, that's far more legitimate. In the US, it was five to four. 330 million people have an incredibly important social policy issue decided by nine human beings. And notice this about top courts everywhere in the world. What is their ultimate decision-making procedure? They vote. 
You cannot get a more brutal majoritarian process anywhere in the world than top courts. In the American Supreme Court, the decision-making rule is five beats four. It's the same in Canada. In, in Australia, it's four beats three because we only have seven top judges. It doesn't matter if the five write insipid, unconvincing, unpersuasive garbage. They win. And the four in the minority write the most beautiful judgments, lots of references to the ICCPR and John Stuart Mill. It doesn't matter. It's purely a numbers game. So the judges who disparage majoritarianism amongst plumbers and sec, that's what they indulge in themselves. And there's no real alternative to that. Because if you build in a substantive test, you're right back to what I start in my book. People don't agree about rights. Nice, smart, reasonable people don't agree about abortion or same-sex marriage or how to deal with those claiming to be um, refugees. And the tendency is to think, because lots of people can't help this, that, I mean, we all think that we're right on moral issues, but the tendency is to think that the person who's disagreeing you, with you is either stupid or evil. There's a funny joke that people on the left of the political spectrum, or people on the right of the political spectrum think people on the left are stupid, and people on the left of the political spectrum think conservatives are evil. Uh, and that's a real temptation to think that. Um, on these sort of rights-related issues, though, usually it's just you're in a world where people disagree on fundamental moral concerns. And, you know, 30 years ago, you used to be a hollow beer and talk to people, and now it with Twitter and social media, it's become impossible. You know, you can try to chat and talk to people, but when their first response is, you're a racist, that sort of cuts off everything right at the knees, right? At that point, you just get mad. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a really big problem. So as I said, I don't think any voter would go for that. I've got about five minutes left. John? Okay, I, I just don't know. I, I can work to what you said. You're not strict on that. No. Okay. All right, so we're, we're not Germanic here. No. We're not having the train roll in right as the, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, as I said, then no regular voter would ever sign up for that. Um, second thing then I'll just talk about, uh, democracy. The way democracy is understood has changed in the last 20, 25 years. And again, I'm talking about the orthodox, lawyerly, judicial understanding, right? Um, everyone pays lip service to democracy. Nobody wants to say, I'm against democracy. They might tell you in a bar or over a drink. My take on democracy is, you know, Churchillian. Winston Churchill, everyone in the English-speaking world knows this, but I'll tell you anyway. Churchill once said, democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else that's ever been tried. And so when people say, look, look, here's a problem with democracy, that is not an answer, right? Every system has a problem. It's like when, uh, you know, left-wing economists say, there's market failure, so we need government to step in. Well, the problem with that is they haven't read uh, Coase and Coase's theorem. You know, Coase points out that there's always failure. Yes, there's market failure, but if your alternative is government, well, there's government failure. And so the, the real question is, is government likely to get this better than the market? And there might be a few times when government is likely to get it right. I wouldn't put you know, the military uh, in the hands of the private sector, but it's not good enough just to say there's market failure. You have to go on and say, what are the failures of the thing you're suggesting replace it? And the sort of blind assumption that bureaucracies and government are likely to get things right. Anyone who's lived through the pandemic these last 20 months, you know, I was skeptical of government back in January of 2020. Now I'm skeptical on steroids, uh, you know, to a level that even the cycling association would detect. So uh, I'm very skeptical of that. And so it's not good enough. And the Benthamite understanding of democracy is basically you see democracy in terms of incentives, sticks and carrots. If all of us are basically engaged in what we think is right or best or in our own self-interest, how do you realign the interests of those with power? And the Benthamite understanding of democracy is just procedural. You try to set up incentives so that those with power 
need to get the approval of a big chunk of the population. That's what democracy does. If you're elected, you want to get, I don't know, 50, 60, 65% of the voters to vote for you. And the way that works is you like being elected. You like the limousine, you like the car. And so you're not able to say, I'm just going to do whatever I want because you won't get reelected. Now, that's not perfect. But I think it's miles better than some elite aristocratic group judges, old-fashioned aristocrats, um, super national elites who say, look, you know, we're not accountable. Don't worry about that because we've looked inside ourselves and I promise you we're doing what's best for you. That doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work because lots of people don't agree on what's best. And what democracy does is it makes those with power try to get your approval. And if they get more than half, they get reelected. So I, never, I have never understood the criticism of oh, that politician only wants to get reelected. We want them to get real, we want them to want to be reelected because then they care about us, right? As soon as they don't want to get reelected, they become free agents. That's a problem. Um, and what, some, what has happened in the last little while is the lawyerly orthodoxy around constitutional has redefined democracy. You can think of democracy in a thin sense and a thick sense. The thin sense is procedural. Everyone counts the same. Everyone gets a chance to vote at regular intervals for who the, who's going to run the government. Right Now, of course, there's elements of morality built in. It has to be a free vote, and there can't be guys with machine guns watching you vote, and we'd like a secret ballot. But assuming it's fair, it's a pretty procedural understanding. It's majoritarian. You can build in different houses and federalism, but it's, it's procedural. And if you meet that, then whoever gets elected is democratically gets the tick. Now, of course, you can have a democratic government that does things you don't like, or you think is evil, even. So that's, and what's happened is that the lawyerly caste has changed that, and they've built in, it only counts as a democracy if you do things that we approve of. You know, it has to be rights respecting, according to us. And so often when you're getting the criticism, it's not democratic, I won't mention Hungary, but when they might say that in Poland, what they mean is they're doing things we don't like. They're not, they don't mean that Poland procedurally hasn't got a democratically elected government. This is terrible, that this, this transmogrification. I'll finish for question time. Let me finish, though, again by thanking Professor Stumpf for uh, spending his time here tonight when he probably would be, uh, could well be doing something much more enjoyable, and John and Melissa and the entire Danube Institute. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Allen. I think your book uh, title, The Age of Foolishness, Doctor, is Guide to the Constitutionalism in the Modern Democracy, uh, sending the very clear message that you are an unorthodox uh, people who had an unorthodox view about, uh, about the legal form and about the law and about, about, uh, about uh, the rule of law, especially. I just would like to raise uh, five issues which very much related to the Hungarian development uh, the last 30 years. One is the, one, the first. I think your most important statement is the next. There is too little love of democracy and also too great love for the unelected justice or judges adopting approaching to interpreting the constitutions that leave those same judges effectively unconstrained. That is uh, very important. You are heavily criticized your books, uh, the judges, saying that these judges wouldn't have produced uh, were their legislator rather than judges. So it's very much reminding me uh, the last uh, 10 years uh, uh, discussion about uh, what was the role of the constitutional court, especially during uh, the transitional period of the Hungarian system changing. The activism of the judges, this is, uh, was the most important criticism against uh, the Shoyan the constitutional court saying uh, that uh, the constitutional courts sometimes over-occupied those kind of responsibility uh, 
which was the responsibility of the parliament. So that is uh, sometimes it's not, not uh, interpreting the constitution, is much more sometimes rewriting the constitution. So you are thinking that uh, those kind of power which you describe in your books and uh, your uh, presentation, and this is uh, very much moving toward uh, the juristocracy, the, the role and the increasing importance uh, of the judges, and also this is very much symbolizing the judicialization of the politics and uh, also uh, the politicization of uh, the law. So that's, uh, that's the general interpretation of what's having, what, what is going on in the world. And uh, you are saying indirectly that we have to reduce uh, the importance and also the power of the judges. That's just uh, one of the first question. The second issue is the rule of law. Uh, you are saying that uh, there are two competing senses uh, in which nation or concept of understanding the rule of law. There is what you can think as of the moral thing or the procedure, procedural sense. You very much stressed uh, the last period of your presentation, the procedural uh, aspect uh, of the rule of law. Uh, don't you think that this kind of stressing so much the procedural part uh, of the rule of law, it's a very technocratic aspect because we have required some kind of moral or value-based aspects when we are talking about the rule of law and later on uh, the democracy. And the other issue is uh, the politics matters. Yes, you describe yourself uh, Churchillian, uh, Democrats, or the, you are understanding uh, the democracy in the Churchillian way, which means that the democracy is the worst form of the government expect for all the others. And also you describe that uh, the worst form of the social decision making going expect for everything else so far tired and that includes uh, being preferable to decision making by top judges. So when you are comparing the two responsibilities, the responsibility of the parliament and the responsibility of the courts, you are saying that your interpretation is if there is the crucial issue raised in the society, the parliament is in the position to say the final word. Am I right when you are interpreting that? I would like that. Because you are very much against uh, uh, those kind of uh, countries where the so-called written constitution played an important role and sometimes very much reducing or modifying uh, the parliament responsibility, giving much more responsibility for uh, the constitutional court. If you look at the European history, it was quite clear that after the Second World War, uh, the European intelligentsia uh, himself, it's very much says that they are responsible for this two world war and that was the reason why we have to accept much more of the fundamental rights and we have to put the whole, uh, whole rights to the constitution and we have to set up an independent body which is going to control that the government is not violating that kind of basic fundamental rules. The model of the European Constitutional Court was the German Constitutional Court, which was very, very strong Constitutional Court. We also followed that kind of line when we set up the Hungarian Constitutional Court. But it's sometimes it is too strong. Uh, that was the reason why uh, I think in, in Europe, you didn't mention in your book and didn't mention in your uh, presentation that the European interpretation is the judicial activism, meaning that this is the judicial activism, it's too much power of the court. And the other side, this is the political constitutionalism, which says the parliament has the right, the elective body has the right to make a final decision. And, and when they are competing each other, it's no question that the parliament has the right to say the final word. 
especially when we are talking about uh, how to modify or amending the constitution. If you have the two-third majority which is required to modify the constitution, and that is the reason why the procedural point of view is very important that you have to follow the procedural uh, things. But uh, if we are talking about, you mentioned uh, the American uh, Supreme Court. Rick Perry, who was the Texas governor, published a book more than 10 years ago called Fed Up. And there is a chapter which is saying why nine unelected justice tell us how to live. That you are very much on that side which saying that we have to modify the responsibility of the, uh, uh, of the American uh, of the Supreme Court. There is a huge discussion around there, you know that, uh, that the, uh, the Democrats would like to increase the number of the Supreme Court because it's a six to three uh, uh, conservative and Democrats uh, uh, composition. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, if the Senate not stop this process, probably they were able to improve the, increase the number of four new justice uh, introduced uh, the last year. But the Senate said, no, it's not at all. And that was the reason why Biden set up uh, the committee, the presidential committee, uh, consists of 36 uh, lawyers, professors, which providing the report about what should we do, how to change the rule of the uh, Supreme Court. And they said that uh, there are two different alternatives. One is increasing the number of uh, uh, the Supreme Court, but it's required, it's, uh, it's not required constitutional modification, but it's not acceptable because the Roosevelt case. And the other is to introduce the term limit, 18 years term limit, not the lifelong uh, nomination. So, but finally, we didn't know what will be the result, but there is a huge decay. So you are saying that the, in the American checks and balances system, the uh, Supreme Court playing a too strong role and we have to modify the balance, giving more power to the executive or the Congress, or this is just uh, because the result of the election and the result of the Trump new, uh, free new nomination to the uh, Supreme Court. So that's, uh, that's you mentioned in your book that the politics matters. Yes, in this case, uh, I think it's very important. The third thing is the strong judicial review, saying that this is also the part of the constitutional unorthodoxy or orthodoxy, much more than orthodoxy. So uh, the strong judicial review that takes place as a form of the constitutionalism, so that's uh, your criticism saying that this, this uh, judicial review is not an appropriate instrument to uh, represent the constitutionalism in the, in the different society. The Hungarian case uh, was that in the, in the very beginning of uh, the constitutional development of the, the system changing, there was a right everybody to send a petition to the constitutional court asking uh, that this or that law is unconstitutional. So, and uh, 10 years ago it's changed. And uh, the new constitutional complaint became one of the most important instrument of the people to go to the constitutional court. So why you are saying the strong uh, uh, judicial review is the, is, is the opposite of the constitutionalism or the opposite of the, of the democracy? Uh, the other and probably the last issue, this is the judicial power. So you said that the, the rise of the judicial power, the judicialization, as I mentioned, the politics is not a good uh, process which is going on. It's very much against the democracy. And uh, also you are very much uh, giving more attention to the unwritten constitution because it gives the room for maneuvering of the parliament and not gives too much power uh, to the court, as far as I uh, realize your sentences. In Hungary, there was a huge debate the last 30 years about uh, the un invisible constitution. 
That was the sentence of the first president of the Hungarian Constitutional Court, uh, Laszlo Sójom. He said, that is the norm, it is a culture and this is the constitutional norm, which is above all the decision making of uh, the different kind of uh, constitutional institution. And this is also the guidelines for those people who would like to modify the constitution as well. So, uh, and after uh, uh, passing the new constitution, the fundamental uh, right. So uh, this is the invisible constitution is not existing anymore. It was replaced by the historical constitution. So in Hungary, there is a very special situation. We have a written constitution, but we have also the right, I mean, the constitutional court has the right to use uh, the achievements of the historical constitution. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, two-based uh, system, how to use the, uh, what are those kind of things, the achievements of the historical constitution, which is in the constitution right now. So the, that is also the part and the importance of the constitutional interpretation, gives much more power uh, to the constitutional court, but of course there was a heavy discussion between the government, the parliament, and the constitutional court, and finally the, uh, the parliament decided with the two-thirds constitutional majority saying that uh, the constitutional court has no right to investigate the content of the constitutional amendment, just the procedural things. But if the constitutional court able to use the constitutional interpretation, especially using the historical achievement of the, uh, that achievement of the historical constitution gives much more power uh, than uh, it, was, uh, it was before. And the last one, there is a huge debate right now in, uh, in Europe, especially in Poland and in Hungary, that if the two type of regulation and the uh, two type of law uh, conflicting each other, especially the European law, and the national constitution, who is going to say the final word? The European, con uh, the, the European uh, court or uh, the, uh, the national constitutional court? I am the sovereignist. I am saying that in this case, not in this case, when the constitution conflicting with uh, the European law, the final word is in, come from uh, the constitutional court. So that's just a few uh, things which I would like to raise. Sorry about uh, the too thick. Thank you.